ask everybody who's got a, phone, a cell phone with them if you can turn that off during the, speak, the speaker. That would be great. Or now, for that matter. <laughs>
have a timekeeper, and De Decker, who is on his right. There are two people in the audience who will give you cards for writing your questions. And if you hold up your card after you write it, they will collect those. So if after the questions that have been prepared for the league are done, there is time we will take questions from the audience. We will start with an introductory statement of one minute from each candidate. We will start on your left and go to the right. Then there will be the questions that are prepared by the league. There are three for which the candidates will have one minute each to respond. And there are two for which the candidates will have two minutes each to respond. Following that, given time, we will start with questions from the audience. I'll ask Gary to announce how long the candidates have to respond to those. At the end, there will be a closing, mm -hmm. and the closing statements will start from your right. I keep having to turn so I know which way it is from your right to the left, and one minute each. So, I think I've covered everything. So let's have Gary start with the questions. start with the uh, opening statements, and we will start with uh, Mr. Chancellor. Thank you. Uh, I've been a small businessman in uh, the Rogue Valley uh, for transfer transmission for 40, 42 years. Uh, I'm married to a great lady. We have five children, uh, 12 grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. I've been a reporter for the U.S. Observer for all about 12 years. I have uh, about 65 published articles on the Constitution, government, and <laughs> I've co created two government group watchdog groups, Jackson County Citizens Group and uh, Wake Up America. Uh, my interest uh, mainly lies in nothing but uh, the government uh, of our county. Try to look at every aspect of it and keep abreast of as much of it as I can. And in the last uh, 20 years, I've logged more time at commission meetings than any three living commissioners. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting on this event. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm Rick Dyer, I'm running for Jackson County Commissioner, position one. I believe the position requires a varied skill set and some good critical thinking skills. Uh, my background, I think, makes me uniquely qualified for this position for several reasons. One, I've been in business about 25 years in Southern Oregon, including 15 years running uh, local dealerships where I manage 50 to 75 employees, multi-million dollar budgets, many departments, and the day-to-day -day operating uh, and policy decisions. In 2008, I opened a uh, Contracting company, if you know anything about the con construction business last six years, it wasn't easy. It took nearly flawless business decisions and fiscal responsibly, uh, responsible decisions to, to survive. I didn't just survive, I strive. My business has been uh, profitable the last six years, which means I do have the ability to work within a budget even during difficult economic times. I served on the RBTD board, where I also was in, in charge, where we had uh, budget responsibilities and union contract negotiations, I think these skills make me unique and qualified for the position. Good afternoon, everybody. And I guess I wanted to also thank the League and also note that not only do you help um, get people registered and inspire us by educating us the, the populace to vote, you also are out there helping us protect our voting rights, and I appreciate that work. I have decided to jump into the arena after practicing law in Medford here for 24 years. Uh, because I have uh, a better uh, a vision of our community, uh, one that is, is one in which we are all doing better, one that is which is one in which um, we are all feeling physically safe, financially secure, and in control of our lives. And to that end, I intend to build coalitions to get work on creating a new economy, and economic development is my primary goal but I also intend to work hard towards um, developing both the physical and the social infrastructure that we will need to become a real vibrant community 
so that our kids can stay here and prosper and raise their families. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I do think the League of Women Voters are pretty impressive. Susan could say all of her names without looking at the notes. Um, my name is Colleen Roberts, and uh, I just want to know and let you know in the primary, I received both the Republican and Democrat nomination for Jackson County Commissioner Position 3. I'm a native of Southern Oregon. I'm a wife, a mother of three grown sons, and a grandmother of 12. I'm a longtime business owner, and uh, my roots run deep, and I care deeply about the future of Jackson County. With decades of private business experience as a business owner, I have a combination of uh, proven fiscal responsibility, collaboration, and uh, effective leadership that we need in our county. It's, I've worked this within a company and within a community. As I met with a master's degree in business, I have uh, I bring the ability to analyze data and financial statements and budgets. I believe in the voice of the people and the power of the Constitution, and it's time both receive, receive some clout and energy and uh, usefulness in our government. And with your vote, uh, I will would be honored to be your county commissioner. <coughs> Hello, I'm Kevin Talbert. First, thanks to the League for hosting this and helping voters be informed when they cast their ballots. For 35 years, I've lived in rural Jackson County, and I believe in giving back to the community that has given my wife, Barbara, who's here today, and I such a full and stimulating life. I'm also motivated to run to provide an option for voters of a candidate and potentially a commissioner who is optimistic, forward-looking, open-minded, and uh, wants to be responsive to community needs. I believe I'm well qualified for this position, having spent the last 35 years in a variety of management and leadership positions in our community. Um, I understand complex budgets, having spent 26 years at Southern Oregon University managing extended campus programs, and uh, I, uh, uh, only 15 seconds, okay. <laughs> and uh, serving later as the Chief Information Officer. Uh, I'm on the road, have been on the Rural Community College Board for 11 years. I'm the president of the Rural Community College Association. Thank you. We will now move to the first question, and uh, we will have one minute to answer this one. And we will start this time with Mr. Talbert and go that direction. Whenever you're ready. And the question is. <laughs> <laughs> Go should for county it. commissioners continue to be elected from a partisan ballot, or should the election be nonpartisan? Well, uh, I like to say that potholes are not partisan, and neither are county roads or county services, or the county mental health, or the animal shelter, or all of the other things that county commissioners do. I don't think people want us to come from a partisan position. I'm a uh, registered Democrat running as a nominee of the Independent Party of Oregon against the repression registered Republican, but who should care? What, what, what does partisanship have to do with being responsive to the citizens of Jackson County? Um, I do care. I care. I want to know who I'm voting for and what slant they are going to take in government. Commissioners do more than fix potholes and roads. They make policy that affect each and every one of your lives. Um, and there's two extremes. There's the uh, the Republican side of which I represent, which is limited government and restricted spending and less in taxes. And that is important to someone who wants to keep their home and live in this valley and succeed. Um, as proven by recently in the Mail Tribune pages of foreclosures in 2014, these people lost their homes. And, and they would probably care if they had a commissioner that wanted to levy more taxes or cared about restricting government. And um, uh, those policies do come from a partisan point of view. I am a registered Republican. My opponent is a registered Democrat. We bring a distinct difference to this ticket. Well, I, I agree to some, some extent that the label does provide some information. But you know, as long as we have a community that we can engage and we have folks like the League of Women Voters who are eager to get um, the candidates to have opportunities to tell what their messages are, those, those labels aren't really necessary. 
They provide some information, sure, but that information can come out in any, any campaign. So I, I tend to agree with Mr. Talbert that we, don't, we just don't need it at the local level. Now this assumes that what we would be doing is you know, voting for all candidates at the general election that are running without regard to, to their, their actual um, their party affiliation. So I believe that, yes, partisan, partisanship is, is not necessarily something we need at the local level. And so if we get it out, we're probably in good, in good shape and we can provide the information we need about our, our individual positions during the campaign. Well, I do believe uh, it offers guidance, um, and, I, and unfortunately, um, no matter how many forums we attend or, or interviews we give, there's a lot of folks who, for whatever reason, don't have time or don't make the time to educate themselves. It does give enough guidance, I think, to make a more educated decision on, on those that don't uh, educate themselves. Um, there is, obviously, we want to encourage as much participation as possible in these elections. Um, I think. This particular race, although Mr. Ankerberg's not here, is a good indication that we've got lots of participation. There are four candidates of very uh, backgrounds and affiliations uh, for voters to, to choose from, and they have the ability to choose whichever one they want in this general election. It's an open general election. Uh, so I believe the guidance that, is, that it offers, uh, I think it's worked pretty well in our county, um, and the guidance that it, that it offers is valuable uh, to prospective voters. And participation, like I say, as evidenced by this race, um, certainly hasn't been a problem in this one. Uh, I believe that uh, anybody that passed on the price of admission should be able to run. Uh, the Republican Party uh, and the Democratic Party, we all know basically where they stand. signatures put me on the ballot. And uh, I would like to see that continue and it makes it possible <coughs> for anybody to get it. And I was the choice of the people I didn't choose for. Them. They chose me. Okay. The next question will also be a one minute answer from each of you and we will start this one with uh, Colleen Roberts. So anytime you're ready. Second. I don't have and this, I, 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 I need to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yes. What, what, would you do, what would you do to increase public participation in and understanding of county government? Oh, that is a passion of mine. I think people should become involved in their county government. You go to the commissioner meetings, and occasionally there is a room full, and occasionally maybe there's a handful, but mostly it's two or three regulars. And um, I just want people to know they have a voice and they have a participation, and they're listened to. Um, recently, there was a public hearing on the veterinarians having to report the dogs that come in for treatment, and they are not licensed, and the veterinarians were not for this. And I talked the local veterinarians into coming to the meeting. I said, come to the meeting, and it's a public hearing. They did, everybody expressed their dissent in the vote. It was passed anyway, and I got a hold of him afterwards. I said, I am so sorry. And he said, I knew it would do any good anyway. That is the perception and the belief we need to change in our county. We need people to know coming and participating does do good, and it will if I'm your commissioner. I think opening up to social media is a great opportunity, as I've seen it work in campaigning. And um, I think the agenda items would be benefited by public participation as well. But I sure, with me as your commissioner, I welcome your participation. Um, I also believe in actually more community-driven um, decision-making at this, at this level of our governance. And so I, part of my, my intent and my platform is to engage the community in strategic planning. What I mean by that is bringing in community leaders to sit down at the table on various topics. One, one near and dear to my heart is uh, the transition to clean energy. So in other words, we would have the folks in the community that, is, that are already doing this work and perhaps bring in experts to further inform, but they would be there and those meetings I would hope to have at times and places 
where the public can come out and also participate or at least um, listen for purposes of engaging. The other thing that I think is important is the um, accessing your commissioners through town halls. And another thing is if we can we can make our, our board of commissioner meetings more accessible to the public so that we can conduct them outside of business hours, I think we should strive to do that as well. Well, I agree with a lot of what has already been said. I think we need to take uh, our message out into the public into other forums, uh, town hall meetings, uh, community events, things like that, and let, let people know what's going on. Uh, Again, people have busy lives. They can't always make it uh, to a 9.30 meeting on Wednesday. I understand that. Um, so we need to make it our job to take that message to them. And expanding, it, it, again, we need to uh, consider budget implications if, if we were to expand uh, the meetings into the evening hours. I don't want to do anything that's uh, prohibitive. Uh, but I think those things, if, if it were shown that that did improve participation, I think we need to do whatever we possibly can and that's being active commissioners. Uh, and like I say, taking our message out into the public. I believe that our commission meetings should be in the evening. Uh, the commission meetings are run for the commissioners, not for the people. And uh, several years ago when I ran for the same office, I uh, ran thinking I could make change by public participation. And I got Jack Walker to agree uh, that uh, we would be given five minutes. I've got him to agree that uh, non-agenda items would be first, not last on the agenda. And uh, to Jack's credit, uh, after he won, uh, he did that. And we've all benefited from it. You don't have to be a candidate to make change, but it helps. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we have a good Well, Lisa, I know what the question is this time. You know what the question is this time. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we've heard a lot of good ideas from, from my colleagues up here, and uh, I, I could second some of those. But I guess I'd point to Commissioner Don Skundrick uh, with his town halls, with the fact that he has made an effort to go out and go to as many community meetings as possible, to meet as many citizens as possible, to meet with city councils and other government agencies. Uh, he's received a lot of community input, had a lot of citizen involvement, and I'd like to emulate that. I don't know if it would be exactly the same way with those town halls, but something similar. I also think that we need to recognize that this program is on Rogue Valley Community Television and that we've cut back, the county has cut back its exposure on community television. That means that fewer people are seeing what's happening in county government and we don't have an interview show that we used to have where county uh, agency heads and other people involved in providing county services were telling the story and taking calls from the public. So those are a couple of things that we could do in addition to some of the ideas that I've heard up here. Okay, our next question, and I will read the question first. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Tony Morrow. This is also a one-minute question. Uh, one of the issues that's been in the news recently, um, and is still in the news, regards the asphalt plant operated by Mountain View Paving near the City of Talent. Uh, do you think the county has handled that issue correctly? I wish I could say I knew um, an awful lot about the procedural posture. I, I don't, but I, I do think um, that I have a concern um, with the department deciding that it was a, a type one um, permit issue with regard to the floodplain permit. So that has cost you know everybody involved some some of the resources in, in this dispute and fight. Now with regard to the original decision with you know application of the code to whether this is a, a grandfathered use or not. That is a matter um, that's first charged to the hearing, the hearings officer under under the code, and so there's not much the board of commissioners could, should, would do about that. That's its own process, and to the extent that they're they're still battling that out, and it's a factual dispute. I guess it'll be resolved by Luba again. Um, but with regard to the decision about the, the type one versus type two, I guess we could have probably done better on that one. Thank you. Uh, as far as disputes between uh, entities, people, uh, it's always a difficult thing. You're going to have one that's upset and one that, uh, well, probably both that are upset, but one's a little more upset than the other. And it's always going to be something that uh, can be criticized after the fact. 
Um, I don't have all of the information that was given to uh, the commissioners, so I'm really not going to have a great value judgment on what they've done. I, I would have to think that they did what they thought was best for the county as a whole. Um, I think that's what you know, the folks that are, that are elected don't become uh, monsters of the government overnight when they were good quality community people and I think they try to do what's best and sometimes it, it, it isn't 100% right but I think most times they certainly try. Uh, no, I don't think what they did was right. First of all, they, they used an administrative system and denied you your trial on land use issues. They eliminated your right. You always had a right to go to a circuit court. You had a right to an elected judge. You had a right to an appeals process. You had a right to go uh, with that appeals process all the way to the uh, Supreme Court. That's been eliminated. They have one guy, he works at the pleasure of the county commissioners, he's called the hearings officer, and he makes those decisions. Uh, he can find you up to uh, $10,000 a day and lien your home if you are uh, non-compliant. So it's a very, very bad situation. Well, I guess the point that I'd make relative to the asphalt plant is that land use is not a one-time event, it's a process. We have a process set out in the law for appeals, for enforcement, for other things. And as a commissioner, I would want to make sure that the county follows its own procedures and make sure that they provide an opportunity for citizen input, that they allocate to the hearings officer, as they did in this case, the authority to receive input and make, make a judgment, and that that appeal is there if it isn't done correctly. There are also legal avenues through the courts that citizens have a right to. So we, we have a process and people need to, to follow that. And I, I guess I get a little frustrated sometimes when I hear people say, well, the county should do this or the county should do that. And what they're really asking for is they're asking for commissioners and county administrators to be arbitrary or capricious and not necessarily follow the laws and procedures that treat everyone equitably. And I believe that that's what we should do as, as a county. Uh, regarding the asphalt plant in particular, I've been at some of the county commissioner meetings where the citizens were trying to air their differences with what was going on with the plant that was affecting their life. Um, they were given their min few minutes that they were given to speak as several of them showed up. And um, I do not know what kind of follow-up the commissioners gave the citizens. I know there's a procedure in place for land use issues like this, and, and until we, if we choose to change them, they are in place, and um, are they equitable? I'm not so sure. I see more and more people at odds with their county government over land use issues. If they've moved a tree near a water stream, or if they've held water in a, in a pond on a property, or they have an asphalt plant, and I believe it's turned regular citizens in our county into criminals. And I've gone to few of the land use, um, the administrative hearings with some of the citizens. And I, you don't have a, a, a trial by an elected judge, you have a trial by a county employee. And it, it, it's concerning, and it, I would take a close look at what we have going and what we can do about it for the citizens in Jackson County. Our next question is a two minute question. This one will start with Rick Dyer. Do you feel that the regional problem-solving process was the right way to address the issue of county growth and why? Uh, as, as far as land use goes, I think we, since Senate Bill 100 was passed, I think that we are in a position here um, where we're treated the same as, as areas that are nothing like us. I think there needs to be some concessions given. I think uh, we live in an area that we live in because that's where we choose to live. Now, uh, of course, there needs to be good land use planning, but I think it needs to be done more at the local level. Um, I think it needs to be more reactive to our needs um, and, and our priorities down here. Um, there are obvious problems that uh, are going to take a lot more than what a county commissioner can do to fix it. Um, and those things are going to take time, and I think we need to, to be patient with the process, but I think uh, we can make a difference, um, hopefully make some change that will allow uh, us to, to grow, not 
Again, not at the same densities as, as Portland or Eugene, because we don't wish to do that, but at our own pace, um, and be a little bit more active in the process. So that's one thing that I will push for, and, and hopefully be able to make some, some change on. I'd like the question again. Okay. Do you feel that the regional problem-solving process was the correct way to address the issue of county growth, and why? No, no, I don't. I, uh, I believe you've elected officials, county commissioners, who have a complete government here that has sworn an oath to a constitution. In fact, the violation of that oath is a crime in Oregon. I believe that these people that you've elected through public input need to make the decisions made on public input and the existence of whatever problem there is at the time that faces it. Everybody that uh, runs for this office wants to represent Jackson County. A large amount of the time you're not representing the people when you're representing Jackson County. You're representing the government. And uh, I think we need to have a lot more hands-on decisions made by the people that we elect. After they've gathered the information from the administrators, we have some very smart people in this valley working in our government. And I just uh, feel that the direction we're going is a road that we shouldn't take. We should revisit the whole process. Thank you. Well, regional problem solving uh, is uh, maybe not a perfect uh, solution. But uh, when you consider the alternatives, it might be pretty good because uh, we are faced with growth. Some people would like to have none, but we're going to have it. Projections are that the Rogue Valley will double in population in the next 50 years. I saw a projection the other day the city of Medford projects to double in the next 20 years. So we're going to have, have more people. And there's not one government entity or one civic entity that represents everyone. There are city governments. There's county governments. There are watershed councils. There are irrigation districts. There's the Rogue Valley Council of Governments. There's, there's a variety of stakeholders in how and where growth occurs. And it all occurs within the context of the statewide laws and our land use laws. So uh, the process that was used in, in that, uh, in the regional problem solving, I think was a process that tried to bring a lot of people together in different forms, to open it to every, public, every citizen to participate and to try to get as much input as possible. So decisions weren't made in a smoke-filled room. They were made in an open and deliberative manner. And I think it's a lot better to make decisions for our future as a region in that manner than it is to make decisions in the courts because some government entity acts in a, in, in a way that can be challenged. So uh, no, it's not a perfect process. Yes, I think it did pretty, pretty well for us. Boy, the first time I heard about the regional problem solving, I ran for county commissioner in 2012. And at that time, I believe it had a complete refinish. And um, it had been going for 10, 12 years and had spent a, a ton of money. And coming down, like uh, Kevin says, from stakeholders, not from people that have some interest and in, uh, ownership of the property. And it's those stakeholders and the non-government organizations involved in policy of our private property that are concerning to me. Uh, it is, it is uh, not people that you've elected that you can take out of office. It's people like LCDC and Rogue Valley Council on Governments. And they're all, they all have a little uh, hand in the game. Everybody gets a cut of the money and it comes down to uh, finances, and if you, if you want your share, you'll play the game. And I think it's really sad, that's where we've come to land use in Jackson County, and it, the biggest uh, gorilla in the room is the Senate Bill 100. How we can repeal that, it, it's, it's not cut in stone. I would love to see it revisited. We are not Portland. We shouldn't be su you know, subject to their um, city ways of living. We are Southern Oregon, and we are country. And it would be great if we could have our own ability to uh, to zone our own property and, and, and have it taken or uh, redistributed because of growth. 
Oregon's land use laws is why we have the quality of life that we do in Oregon. Um, the land use goals that were adopted 30 years ago, or maybe even longer than that, require communities like ours to plan, to plan for all kinds of things, but importantly, to plan for growth. And what, what this 10-year uh, regional planning process did is it, it got all of the local jurisdictions that could do all this work separately to satisfy their, their goal planning process, it got them all together, and everybody sat down, as I understand, and decided who wanted to, to um, accept the growth in the county. You know, I believe Ashton decided they didn't really want to accept so much of the growth that the county is going to be, um, will end up receiving over the next 10, 20 years. So they've decided to, you know, instead infill. So some of that growth is now going to be um, absorbed by, for instance, Central Point, I guess. I don't know all the, the substantive details of what was adopted, but from what I understand, the process has been celebrated at the state level as a, a great, great model for communities working together to do some land use planning. With regard to the issue about you know, our, our southern counties being different perhaps, perhaps than, than we are from the Willamette Valley, our farm and forest rules are still broad enough that, that we, can, we can carve out distinctions, but we also have a new process going on that we need to, we need to watch and, and we can potentially use to address some of those distinctions. And it's Executive uh, Order 1207 that the um, Governor Kitzhopper recognized that there's some concerns about our counties being differently. So there's a process going on right now with regard to looking at those farm and forest land goals. Um, that's it. Thank you. This will be our final question from, from, uh, from me. If we have time, we will move to questions from the audience. Uh, this will be a two-minute question. And we will start with Mr. Chancellor this time. What is the long-term solution for county the county's budget problems? You know, I think the long term is the county has been very active in putting businesses, small businesses, uh, a lot of home businesses, out of business. Uh, they have made qualifications to be in business so hard that most people can't, can't be And uh, home businesses employ far more people and bring far more into our county than we would ever believe. That's one place to start. The other thing is, is you, you have to put a, more than a smiley face on and ask businesses to come to us. So we're going to have to make a lot of changes. And uh, I believe that change can be made by making a case for change. And I think there's a lot of room to make a case for change to bring business in. We are so anti-business in Oregon that uh, uh, unless you're uh, trying to make a, a brush for chicken down, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous what we have placed on uh, the ability of a business to come here and survive. Not all business is dirty, and I think that uh, the long-term answer is uh, the economy. It has to be brought back to bringing businesses in and allowing businesses that are here now to expand and uh, tell the federal government in no uncertain terms we want our land back, period, and take it to court if need be. But uh, it's got it's got to it's got to be business, and it has to be getting our uh, money back for our timber. Well, um, I guess I would say that uh, there probably will never be enough uh, county, enough uh, funding and enough resources uh, to do all of the things that people would like to have county, the county do. Uh, there are always services that, that are in demand and we just don't have enough. So commissioners, I think, are charged with finding the right balance. Uh, my opponent likes to say that you can't find fee or tax your way to prosperity, and I totally agree with that. But I also believe that the converse is true. You can't not have fines, fees, and taxes and think that you're going to have a prosperous county. You only have to look at the counties that surround us and say if you like what's going on in Josephine or Curry County, then you don't want to have very much government. 
And uh, so I, I, I think people really need to ask themselves if that's, that's what they want. But uh, uh, long term, the county needs to look for ways that it can sustain itself besides taxation. And to some extent, we've made a lot of progress with that because we have many enterprise operations within the county. The airport, parks and recreation, the county clerk, the assessor's office, Many county operations recover the costs of operation from the fees that they're charging the users. So instead of going to taxpayers and saying they have to pay for everything, it's the people that are directly using those services. And uh, one of the things that I think I would bring to the commissioner position is the programs that I managed at the university for many years were enterprise operations. We had to find ways to be creative, to be entrepreneurial, to make sure that we could generate the fees for whether it was summer session or conferences and workshops or our senior or youth programs. And uh, the county has an opportunity to do that in some of its areas. It's made a lot of progress. There's still a ways to go. That will help stabilize the county budget. Well, the long-term solution, I don't know what you're considering long-term, but when you look at the last 10 years, we've certainly lost a lot of jobs a lot of businesses, a lot of employment, and um, that it survived, <laughs> but um, I think we can survive better by government getting out of the way, by government um, stepping back and being less restrictive where, where citizens can thrive, where the private sector can thrive. Yeah, Jackson County, you say, you're all the time, Jackson County's doing great, and Jackson County is. The private sector is struggling. They're unemployed, like the sheet of, uh, foreclosures, they're losing homes, and, and we've just passed new taxes on top of that. I, I believe uh, it's allowed the commissioners to put a lot of money back in the rainy day fund, and uh, that is good. It'll help us in the tough times as they come. Uh, but I believe economic growth comes from a restricted, um, small government. Government should be small, the private sector should be big. But secondly, I do believe, you know, I've heard it said, when God gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Well, God gave Southern Oregon natural resources. And what do we see them done? We see unmanaged lands burn up, burn up cities. And that is just um, unconscionable. I, I believe for our own forests, we need to be managing the woods for our safety, for our health, and for our financial gain. And there is something, Plymouth County just signed on, it's called the Land Transfer Act. And it's nothing really counties could do alone, but it's counties banding together saying, we want our land back from the federal government. We want to use it for Oregon. And depending on what kind of governor we get in Oregon, it could have some powerful, powerful um, benefits to Jackson County. But I would definitely, um, it's Ken Ivory's model from Utah, and it's a great, uh, happy to talk to anybody about it afterwards and give you the information I have. But it's a great opportunity for our, our county. Budget concerns, the best way for us to deal with that, I believe, is economic development. Um, we grow this economy, we're going to have more resources available to do the things that we need, want to do um, with regard to county governments, providing that both physical and, and, and social infrastructure that our community needs in order to thrive. Um, we also need to figure out ways of leveraging the resources that we have. I understand that um, Commissioner Skundrick has done um, quite a bit with regard to obtaining and assisting in getting grants for some of our, our transportation projects. And we need to continue that kind of work. If there are state and federal programs out there that provide money for local governments, we need to be, all of our department heads, we need to be working, uh, rolling up their sleeves, looking for those programs and, and writing the grants so that we can bring, bring those monies in so we can continue to do this great work. Beyond that, I would say that um, we have been dealing with this declining budget situation for several years now, and I am very, very proud of the staff that we have at our, in our county government. They have rallied together to, to deal with um, the difficulties of having to reduce their own budgets. They've, of course, had to go through some difficult times of laying people off, but we are extremely fiscally sound, and yes, We've been tapping into reserves, we are finding ways of, of replenishing those, but we really do need, and one of the things we've lacked, I'm sure that's, that's been a focus and it's, it's taken a lot of energy to get through this period, um, but we 
we needed to spend a little more effort and energy finding, finding the resources. And again, it doesn't have to come from taxes. It can come from <coughs> private parties, um, foundations, that kind of thing, to work on economic development. So that's what we've needed to do. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and, and get busy doing that. Our forest, we need to maintain them and manage them. We're going to still want to have people out there working in the forest. That's important for our, for our health as well. Um, but we don't need, we, we need to get beyond the idea that we're going to be having timber receipts and figure out a way of selling our forest to, to our, the rest of our, our nation um, and so that we can, we can receive receipts in different, for different reasons. Thank you. Well, I think several things we can do. First of all, we just fiscal responsibility and looking at every single program, whether existing or new, and analyzing it as to its effectiveness, its necessity and its affordability. And if it doesn't meet those criteria, then we don't need to spend uh, the resources on that. And that needs to be an ongoing process, like I say, existing and any new program that, that may be proposed. Uh, secondly, as far as getting back, I, I think we can uh, reinstate and renew some uh, timber harvesting, and, and it needs to be done for several reasons. Uh, one, obviously, the forests are in a state of neglect, and a lot of that is because they haven't been thin. They haven't been log and they haven't been utilized um, and it not only obviously there's many fronts that, that affects us on we have a dangerous situation out there we have uh, densities in the forest that are 10 to 20 times what they've been in a natural state we have undergrowth that is just a tinder box waiting to go up in, in flames which it does regularly but the big problem too is we don't we can't build fire breaks we are taking out roads so there's a there's a recipe out there and all the ingredients are out there for a disastrous million acre plus fire, which would be a catastrophe in our area. And we need to do something about making sure that doesn't happen. But by doing that, we can put people back to work in the woods. Um, House Bill 1526, 50% um, sustainable harvest, I think that in, in using Good Forest Management pra Practices Act, uh, being sensitive to watersheds and habitat and, and uh, wildlife is important. Um, and, and again, putting people back to work, county revenues uh, and the economy in general will, will benefit. Uh, the other thing is economic development. We have to have a specific plan. I only have 30 seconds here. We have, we've lost over 7,000 jobs in the last seven years, and the jobs we have, our median income is one of the lowest in the country. We need to get good paying jobs. We have some tech sector uh, jobs here that are doing well. We need to focus our attention on going out and getting those companies here and aggressively pursuing them to come back, selling them on what we have because we have a great product here that these companies would love to relocate in if we, if we actually sold them and showed them the story. extent that county commissioners can, how would you change the current priorities? Well, the county actually has adopted a list of about a dozen priorities, I don't have it here in front of me right now, talking about the things that they want the county to do, and they're good priorities, and it's interesting to me that when I read that, I hear that these are unranked priorities, that all of those priorities have to be considered in terms of the budget allocations that are made by the commissioners and the budget committee. Uh, but yet, I repeatedly hear people say public safety is our number one priority. And I think people are concerned about public safety, but uh, I think that people should recognize that public safety isn't just the sheriff and the uh, jail. It's uh, a whole range of things. We have to think of the prevention side of public health. We have uh, mental health. We have juvenile services. We have the courts. We have a lot of different things. So if, if you consider public safety, it's not just incarcerating people. It's providing preventive services. So the county needs to look at all of those goals that it has. Commissioners need to weigh this. We probably need another public process to review those and see if they are the right priorities for the county going forward. 
I think it's always good to look, to revisit your priorities and your goals, uh, personally, government-wise. Uh, but I'd like to read you Jackson County's mission statement. I would think that would be high on our priority. And it says, Jackson County's mission statement is to provide public service that protects and enhances the quality of life in the county with three qualifiers. The first one being, as determined by the people. I love that one. I agree with it wholeheartedly. Secondly, by the and third, with available resources. Um, I would love to be your county commissioner and bring that mission statement to life. I see our county commissioner state uh, buy into um, federal and state money, any monies they can get, without looking at the strings attached. Those concern me. I think we need to look at grant monies. I think we need to use them and take them wisely with a, with a grain of prevention. I think determined by the people and with our available resources is the strongest priority we can have for our county and one I will seek to always gravitate to um, for the people of Jackson County. Well, again, to the extent that the priorities, priorities we're talking about are, are shaped the, in the budget process, and they could and should be. Um, obviously, we, can, we have probably some, some priorities identified in our mission statement, but each, each time we go through a budget process, we have the opportunity to reshape the priorities of the community. So there, therein lies the process, and we, again, need to bring the community and engage the community so that there's more input with regard to that. Um, otherwise, I go back to, once again, it, it's economic development. Um, economic development will, I, I, maybe it's a cliche, but I think it will solve a lot of our concerns and problems. To the extent the, uh, the community believes there's some public safety issues and concerns, and I'm hearing that too when I'm out canvassing, if we can get people, you know, if we can get people to be able to plug in with great jobs, um, and uh, you know, have a community that's there to, to um, address uh, addictions and, and other, other um, causes of criminality, um, th that's what we need to develop, and I think economic development will help us go a long way with regard to that. I'm gonna agree with that too. The economic development is one of those where all boats rise um, and, and crime is reduced when people have jobs. Um, but I do think we need to continue to focus on public safety as its own entity as well. Uh, there, there is a tremendous amount of drugs and crime in this county, and as a, as a father of a 10-year-old son, that concerns me uh, greatly. Uh, I want people to feel safe in their homes, uh, their kids safe in their schools and neighborhoods, and I think that always should be a priority of ours. Uh, economic development, of course, we need jobs here, and as I said before, we need good jobs. Uh, and we need to focus our attention and have more of a defined plan than just saying, let's, let's go find businesses to locate here. Uh, let's help the businesses that are here to succeed and expand and hire. And let's go looking for the right businesses. The tech industry, like I say, we have already a lot of that aspect and component here. We can build on that. We can build, bring in good living wage jobs that are 150 to 200 times our medium income level. And again, all boats rise, uh, tax revenues increase, and the economy in general. Each one of those jobs can create up to four new jobs. And that's where we need to really concentrate our, our attention. You know, as an investigative reporter, and mainly my beat is uh, law enforcement, judges, and district attorneys. No one likes to hear or wants to hear the things that go on behind closed doors in this county. And one of the things that I feel that needs to be done, other than the obvious things that we've already spoke of in the economy, is our, our county commissioners and other elected officials that swear an oath to the Constitution need to understand that the Constitution is not an abstract concept. It's the Constitution. And uh, not a single solitary one of our commissioners is not guilty of uh, malfeasance of office for the things they're doing right now. And what I would bring is a constitutional government. And the most important way we can help the people is for our elected officials to bear their oath. Thank you. Okay, it is time for closing statements. We will have one minute for each of those, for each of you to have a closing closing remarks, anything you'd like to add to what has been said. And we will start with Mr. Calvert on this one.
Well, we, I haven't really had a chance to talk about some of the economic development ideas that I have, but one, one area that I really am emphasizing is value-added agriculture for Southern Oregon. We, we have a lot of unique uh, microclimates here. We can grow uh, many different things. The GMO ban provides us with a wonderful marketing opportunity for our organic uh, products that are, that, that are grown here in the county. And I'd like to see us pay attention to those and have for the county to do what it can to support those efforts. Um, I'd like to repeat what I said at the beginning. If you want a commission that's going to be optimistic, it's going to be forward-looking, it's going to be listening to the public, and is committed to solving problems, then uh, I hope you'll vote for me in the election because I think it's easy to be a critic and talk about all the problems. It's harder to solve problems. And I, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and get the job done and I have a track record to support that. So I ask for your vote and uh, thanks for uh, being informed. Well, I just thank you again for coming here today. And um, I do believe economic growth and natural resources are key to our economy here in Jackson County. I believe lessening restrictions are very important and, I, and fiscal responsibility um, at every level of our government, including the commissioners, needs to be um, addressed. And as far as being um, a critic of the problems, you know you can't be a critic unless you realize there's problems to solve. And as, as someone sat, sat in many commissioner meetings, I've seen the problems that our commissioners um, face and that our county is facing, and we need to address those. Uh, our employment is one, our budget is another, and transparency and accountability to the people is so very important. I know it's said that if we have public meeting laws, nothing can happen behind closed doors. You know, we have a constitution, and without effort and work, neither one of them provides their intent to be constitutionally ran or to provide accountability to the citizens <coughs> that we, we need to have as your commissioners. So I ask you for your vote, and I will represent you with the best uh, service I can bring. Again, again, thank you all for being here, and thank you to the League for, again, fostering education about um, candidates and our political process. Uh, I guess I'd just say, again, um, I am in this um, because I, I want to see our community become a 21st century community and have a new economy and make sure that we are um, developing our systems, our urban systems, and we are protecting our ecosystems so that they are resilient and can withstand the, the, the challenges that we're going to see in the future. Um, and so to that end, I. Um, believe that I have the capacity to do this work. I'm a very hard worker. I, I have developed um, very good problem solving skills and one of the one of the skills that I, I really cherish and I think it's just a, it's a benefit to have and that is um, the ability to listen and practicing law for 24 years that that skill I've honed and I intend to get out and listen to folks and bring the community together to work on some of these projects. Well, I will echo thank you very much for being here. Thank you to the League for hosting the event. Um, I just want you to know, I, I am not running for this position because I'm on a single issue crusade or I have some very specific agenda that I'm pursuing. I am running because I do care about Jackson County. I've been a resident almost 40 years. I met and married my beautiful wife here. I have a 10-year-old son that, that attends public school here. Um, and, and I have a deep passion for the county. I've given back as a RBTD volunteer, a youth coach, um, and many other civic and charitable organizations. My education I didn't get to before, I have a degree in business administration in accounting. I have a law degree, I'm a licensed attorney. I passed the, the most difficult bar exam in, in the country on my first attempt while running my business, while coaching, while doing all these other things. I have the ability to take on a lot of complex tasks and multitask very well, and I think those are those are attributes that are necessary for this position. And I think I can return us to the level of prosperity and retain the quality of life that we all enjoy here and that we want for our children. Well, my uh, I don't believe in being single facet on anything. I, I believe that we have strayed so far from the principles of this country was built on that our founders would even recognize it as the same country. I believe we have a school system that has failed our children in history, citizenship, and in duty. 
uh, I'm a fighter. I've been a fighter all my life. I've never backed down from anything. And there's a big fight that needs to be here in the commissioner's meeting to explain to the people Senate Bill 100, how it's affecting them, and how it can be changed. And I think it could be changed through uh, our joint, our United Counties. Thank you very much. And also, I'd like to thank the League of Women's Voters. Uh, this is not my second time, or it is my second time to be here. I've always enjoyed it, and I think you do great work. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this part of the, uh, of the um, race forum. However, there are some really good questions that you asked that we couldn't get to. So I'm going to ask the candidates uh, to stay after for a while if you'd like to address those to them here in, within the room. And I only have uh, three things to say. The last day to register to vote is October 14th by that uh, evening. The ballots will come out on the 15th and the 19th. And election day is November the 4th, and get your ballot uh, signed and back in by that evening. So let's go out and vote. Years in great in for good governance is the League of Women Voters. I guess it was uh, comparison. I guess we'll keep going. We have, we have the third one. So if you'd like, I mean, I know your question is important, but if you'd like to see it for a minute, they are going to be here. So you guys will ask the question. Yeah, we still have only one minute answer. Yes, yeah, let's, let's keep it yeah, in mind. Let's do that. Uh, and we will start this time with Colleen Roberts, I believe. Yes, it is. It's amazing. We're still going. <laughs> County prepare for global warming consequences and reduce our contribution to the problem? Well, I don't know that the commissioner's purview is, involves global warming. <laughs> um, I think our seasons change. I believe our, uh, our uh, natural resources have a big deal to do with uh, global warming. Um, not being an expert in, in uh, global warming, I would just say, you know, I don't know, I think logging and managing what we have in the woods has changed our, our uh, climate here in Jackson County. But I think uh, being wise stewards of what God gives us is a big um, portion that we need to do. And uh, if that's our natural resources and our woodlands, we need to do that. Uh, the county can get involved in um, doing some of the work that's starting at the, both the, the federal and the state level to, to um, transition us to clean energy. And so that will not only help us um, satisfy some energy demands by way of finding efficiency, going to renewables, it will keep our money in our community and it will put people to work, um, but it'll help us get off of um, oil dependent means of, um, and coal dependent means of energy and electricity. The other thing we can do is we can start planning again to make sure our infrastructure is ready for these, these potential um, impacts, which may include extreme weather, um, persistent fire, hopefully not catastrophic fires, but we need to plan for that, so we need to get out in force and maintain them. 
Um, we need to be prepared for, for uh, persistent drought. So there are things that the county can do. They can, the county commissioners and the board of commissioners can lead the community in the planning that needs to be done to address some of these things. The other thing we can do is really start addressing um, transportation by way of encouraging um, electric vehicles and making sure that we have the infrastructure for that as well. Thank you. Well, I prefer uh, my, my business. Um, I have a window replacement business. I didn't ask for any government assistance when I opened that business, but I, in, in six plus years, I have made 600 homes in Jackson County much more energy efficient. They use less energy. Their homes are more affordable and more comfortable. I employed local labor. Do it, and, and all those things benefited more than just uh, the, the cause. Um, and I, I would do more to encourage a, a private enterprise pro approach. People do want to be more efficient. Uh, we can help them get there, uh, but we can help them get there in a more direct way. I don't think uh, some, of the, some of the proposals that will adversely affect the economy, I, I think uh, is the wrong approach. I think what we need to do is, is do things that uh, help with that problem and also help the economy and help put local folks to work and make their homes more affordable, and that's, that's the approach I've taken. I would take the approach of putting people back to work. Uh, global warming is uh, an issue that I haven't bought yet completely. It's my understanding they need a study of about 200 years. They only have about 135 years study. And uh, this whole country world's been around for millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And I've been concerned myself for four years that I'm there if elected to uh, taking care of the people. I'll let everybody else worry about global warming. I'm worried about people that are losing their homes, lost their jobs because of uh, the global warming scare. Thank you. I agree with many of the things that Rick and Tanya talked about in terms of uh, promoting a greener county uh, with energy efficient, uh, wise use of water. Uh, we are going to have uh, less snowpack, we're going to have lower stream flows, we're going to have to consider what that means for our agricultural base. And uh, the WISE project that many of you know about uh, is an effort to try to reduce uh, or to use our water more efficiently going forward, not lose so much, to be able to preserve the infrastructure that, that, we, that we have. And I'd like to see the county do that. The county can't solve all of the global warming problems alone, but what the county has the ability to do is convene people into groups to try to solve problems together. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got irrigation districts, we've got uh, watershed councils, we've got uh, the state and federal government that have a stake here in terms of how we use our uh, energy resources. And so the county really is, can be a convener in, in, in getting people together to talk about how we're going to do these things and to get everybody on the same page and move ahead. So the county can reduce its carbon footprint and use a lot of more effectively. Okay, this one we'll start with Tony Morrow. What will you do as commissioner to resuscitate the private sector economy? This is to everybody. This is to everybody. Who's starting here? Uh, oh, again. Yeah. Again, it's it's exactly what I want to do. Um, I, I don't have all of the answers, but I have the ability, I believe, to get the folks that, that um, know what we might need to do um, to the table. And so what one of my first focuses is going to be is to convene community leaders with regard to economic development so that we can identify some new models out there that are working, um, adopt them, and, and, and develop the strategies that are going to work here with regard to those models, and, and get our economy which means not only bringing in new companies, and the work is so ready is, is still, they're, they're working on that. I spoke with Ron Fox at So Ready yesterday, and he's got some great new ideas, and he will actually be asking the, the county for some money for, for those ideas. And that's one thing we need to do, is the county's been very um, funding with So Ready with, uh, with only $26,000 for years and years and years. We need to invest there, but we also need to get new ideas together do the strategic planning, figure out how to implement them, and that's what we'll do to help the private sector. I'm going to agree. We need to get all the entities that are in play here together, whether it be municipal governments, civic groups, uh, concerned citizens groups, county government, get them together, get them to start to, to play together, and not so much infighting, so we have a, con a consistent, 
cooperative and collaborative approach, and that always works better than people butting heads. Um, I do think we need to make a little more investment into our economic development here. Um, it, what's been happening hasn't been working, so we need to try a new approach. And like I say, there are living wage jobs, and we go after all the, the, the low wage jobs and keep our, our median income in the, in the low to mid 30s, and it doesn't really help our local economy a whole lot. If we can go out and attract the right kind of business, the clean uh, tech industries that will do well here, and if we show them and we sell them on, on what we've got here, they will come here. They're, this is a much more attractive place to live and do business than where most of them are right now, and that's in Silicon Valley or California somewhere. Uh, those are the efforts that I think are going to pay the most dividends. They're going to bring in the better, higher paying jobs, which again translates a multiplier effect into much more uh, economic development and growth. And that's the plan I think we need to take. For me, government uh, needs to be small, efficient, accountable, and absent wherever possible. And every time that that environment exists, business flourishes. The only thing you need to make business go is get government out of its way. Now you have to be responsible about it, but business isn't the problem. Government's the problem. And the first thing that I would take a look at and attack is all of the uh, county ordinances that control business and make the adjustments necessary. Well, it's true that the private sector is the dynamo that drives our economy, but uh, the private sector does need uh, roads and uh, water and uh, sewer and uh, electricity and all of those infrastructure things, that telecommunications that, that, that businesses depend on. The government has a lot to do with those, so I think it's a public-private partnership that we really are talking about here. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, Rick uh, emphasized the some of our 21st century technology businesses. We have an unusually high concentration of technology businesses here in the valley for a small city. We have some 276 businesses that fall into that category. And the salaries that are available, the wages for the people working in those industries is well above the median. It's the kind of employment that we keep young people here if we can bring those industries forward. So I, I support uh, doing that, and I also support what I mentioned earlier, the value-added agriculture, our vineyards, our wineries, our niche foods. Uh, there, there are a lot of opportunities for us, and those agricultural industries also help us preserve the kind of lifestyle that we value here, that interspersion of rural areas with urban development. Well, economic development is very important. I don't agree with Solretti being one that says creates jobs. We give them 26,000, I believe, Commissioner Spender gave them 150000 year after year to bring new jobs here. they are businesses that came in unaccountable. They didn't have to prove they created jobs. They didn't have to prove anything. They were handed an empty, uh, just a grant, and they didn't have to prove a thing of our money. And I disagree with that. And government isn't in the business of picking winners and losers. I'm a private business owner. I've not been picked by the county, nor would I take those controls to take uh, on a work. Uh, that depended on county, as will our WISE project. It is, it is going to be um, channeling water, and if you say, Mother, may I pay up money, you'll be able to get your water. I believe in government getting out of the way and letting us live free and independent with liberty, whether we want to own a business, run a business, or work here in the valley. And I believe the government is just collaboration, and more of it is not what I'm seeking or would strive to do for you as well. This one we will start with Rick Dyer. Given the organic growth rate of 1.2 billion board feet within the ONC counties, will you commit to revitalizing the private sector by retooling sustainable lumber mills after steps to mitigate wildfire risks? I think we absolutely need to, to reinvigorate the entire industry and for lots of reasons that were stated earlier. Uh, first of all, first and foremost, most the health, safety, and welfare uh, of the citizens, that, and that is in great danger. Um, and as far as uh, the, the, the timber industry in general, I think we can, it's not going to be what it was, but I think we can uh, reinvigorate it, uh, retool it, and make it a viable part of our economy again, especially in the rural areas. I was up in, 
in Prospect, talking to some folks that have lived there for 50 years, and they, they said, used to be, live in Prospect, you could go to work when you got out of school, forest service or out the world. Now there are no jobs up there. And Hidden Prospect has basically one choice if you want to stay in Prospect, and according to him, all they, all they can do there is, is sell drugs. That's the only way to make a living. Uh, that, that I think is a travesty. We need to be able to reinvigorate these rural areas, uh, get back out in the woods uh, with a sustainable harvest, and I think we're a long way from that right now, and, and that is certainly something that will be a priority. Uh, I'll just ditto Rick on, on that. I, uh, I agree 100%. Okay. Well, we have a forest products industry that's been uh, part of our heritage, and it's something that people appreciate and, and value. And um, I wish it could be the way it was. And people have talked about going back to our natural resource economy. But, but I have to tell you that we're never going to go back to the way it was. Those days are over. What we need to do is try to preserve the infrastructure that we have for forest products here because we have an investment in it and we need to work collaboratively to do that. The county isn't going to make those decisions. A lot of them are going to be made in Washington, D.C. and other places. The county has a lobbying effect and I believe any Jackson County Commissioner has got to work as a lobbyist to try to enhance or, or try, to, try to get uh, laws at the federal level that will solve some of these problems. But we're not going to solve, solve them locally, and I think we could put our energy into looking what, at what the alternatives are. I heard things like adding value. You know, we need to sell laminated beans, beans, not not raw logs. I mean, there are things like that that, that we can do to enhance our, our, our local forest products industries, and the county should support that. But I think we should realize that, that we're not going to be a natural resource county going forward only. We've got to diversify, and we have to look for where the jobs are in the 21st century. And diversification is important, but so is our natural resources. And we do still have some timber industry open here. We have Boise Cascade. We have Rough and Ready that's back uh, ready. <coughs> we have uh, two businesses that have endorsed my campaign, Metro Building and Biomass, all dependent upon us utilizing our natural resources. They know it's important. They are ready and open for business. How better could we help them, but from the county <coughs> level, to ensure that their um, natural product would be coming in? We had a judge one year ago that ordered uh, the harvest of our timber to be at the federal lands to be ramped up, and it has not followed through. Where's our commissioners at the table there demanding that a judge's order be followed through? I think we need to be there. We need to be following what is uh, being recommended at the federal level, get our forests open, and keep our businesses that do rely on the um, timber industry with, with product they can use. I agree with what um, Mr. Talbert said um, generally about where the county stands with regard to that industry, but I guess I'd also add that um, we do need to have folks working in the forest. And I guess I've recently been um, attending forums on workforce development and I've learned that there's, there are very few young people going into forestry and, and you know, logging anymore, so we're losing some of those skills. And, I also learned um, yesterday that uh, the plants are actually having find, uh, a hard time finding millwrights these days, or plant managers. But we, we need people working in the forest, and we need to thin those forests. And we're going to take we're going to take um, trees and, and wood products out, and we need to continue to to uh, help those industries retool if that's the word to use, so that we can make those products, whether it's making them into energy or making them into to value added products, that we can continue to have a market. Um, so that's, that's the kind of work that so already does, and I think the county can support that as well. Okay. We're going to stop at this point. Thank you all for staying. We've got about 15 minutes to get out of the room. So. <laughs>